behalf of Pastor Holly, myself, Pastor Doug, and the whole congregation here at Burnt Hills United Methodist Church, we say welcome to worship on this World Communion Sunday. While we cannot share communion with you online, we will be doing that, sharing communion, in our in-person service this morning. The concept for a World Communion Day actually began back in 1933 at the Shadyside Presbyterian Church in Pittsburgh. Reverend Hugh Kerr and his congregation wanted to demonstrate the interconnectedness of Christian churches regardless of their denomination and they chose the sacrament of Holy Communion as a way to symbolize that unity. Now, when Shadyside first started it, they were alone, but they spread the word and encouraged their neighbors to join them. And then in 1940, the Federal Council of Churches of Christ in America, which includes both today's and the predecessor of today's many denominations, adopted the Worldwide Communion Sunday, and the concept really started to spread. Today, World Communion Sunday is celebrated around the world as a way of demonstrating that while each denomination, each church, may have its own way of thinking and understanding of how to worship, how to be in relationship with God, we are all connected and share the understanding that we are followers of Christ. Those differences extend to the details of how we celebrate communion. But the sacrament itself is a focal point wherever you may travel around the world and encounter Christians. So let us begin worship on this World Communion Day with these words. On this World Communion Day, we recognize we are part of the Church Universal faithful people of every color, gender, class, orientation, age, ability, and origin gathered to love and serve God. We seek to be an open and welcoming church, seeking to worship God and rejoicing in the good news of Christ. There is a place in God's heart, indeed at Christ's table, for each and every person who wishes to come. Christ who gathers us, bids us follow in ways of love and justice. May our hearts be open to Christ's leading in our worship and in our living, today and every day. And let us join in our opening hymn this morning, I Come with joy. Thank you. 
Our scripture reading for this morning comes from Psalm 26. And I'll be reading from the New Revised Standard Version. This psalm is titled, A Plea for Justice and Declaration of Righteousness. Vindicate me, O Lord, for I have walked in my integrity, and I have trusted in the Lord without wavering. Prove me, O Lord, and try me. Test my heart and mind. For your steadfast love is before my eyes, and I walk in faithfulness to you. I do not sit with the worthless, nor do I consort with hypocrites. I hate the company of evildoers, and I will not sit with the wicked. I wash my hands in innocence and go around your altar, O Lord, singing aloud a song of thanksgiving and telling of all your wondrous deeds. O Lord, I love the house in which you dwell and the place where your glory abides. Do not sweep me away with sinners, nor my life with the bloodthirsty, those in whose hands are evil devices and whose right hands are full of bribes. But as for me, I walk in my integrity. Redeem me and be gracious to me. My foot stands on level ground in the great congregation. I will bless the Lord. We give thanks for these words from Scripture. And let us now prepare for young disciples' time as we hear the familiar hymn, Jesus Loves Me. Welcome to Young Disciples Time. I'm so glad that you have chosen to be with us today. We actually hope to see you in Sunday School as that started up two weeks ago and we're already having lots of fun there. Today I want to talk to you young folks about that word that's already been used today, communion. And you might remember it if you've ever been to church. That's when mom and dad and maybe you have a chance to get up, walk to the front, and get that little cup of juice and a little piece of bread. Now, you probably don't know what that's all about, but I hope you enjoy it. But today, I wanted to talk a little bit about what those things are. So, if you are old enough to remember, we often use what's called a chalice. It's a special type of cup. And as you come forward, the grape juice, which is what we use, is in the chalice. And we also use bread. It could be a big loaf of bread, it could be pita bread, just bread of some kind. And that's really important because in the story of the Bible, there's a place where Jesus goes to what's called the Last Supper. It's the last time he shares a meal with his followers. And there he goes through this process of he takes the bread and he breaks it. He says a prayer over it to God, gives thanks for the food they're about to eat. And then he shares the bread. He passes it around to all the others that are with him, asking them to take a piece of it. 
And he says to them, think about this bread as representing my body. It's not really my body, but just think of it as something that represents that. So that we are all sharing together in Jesus. And after dinner, he lifts up the cup and he says a prayer again to God, giving thanks for the wine or the juice that they're about to drink. And then he passes the cup around and he says again to everybody there, share this. Think of it as part of me that is given to help you. Now there's a lot more to it than that, but that's the part I wanted you to take away today, that when we do that kind of communion, the bread and the juice that's in the cup are supposed to be representing Jesus himself and the things that he did for our lives. So every time we do that, or even every time you eat any meal, you can give thanks to God for the food and the drink that you have and for all that God gives you in your life. Let us pray for a moment. Loving God, we give you thanks for the food in our lives, for the people that we share it with, and for your son Jesus, who brought so much to this world. May we always remember and give thanks. Amen. And now let us join in our next hymn this morning. I want Jesus to walk with me. I want Jesus walk with me all along this pilgrim's journey I want Jesus to walk with me when I'm in trouble walk with me when I'm in trouble Walk with me When my heart Is almost breaking I want Jesus To walk with me Well in my trials Walk with me Well in my trials Walk with me When my head Is bowed in sorrow I want Jesus To walk with me Walk with me Come walking with me Come walking Let us take a moment in prayer before our message this morning. Gracious God, we do give thanks for all that you have given our lives, for Jesus, for our families, and for the words of Scripture that can guide us, that can be places to find comfort, that can be words that challenge us. Open our hearts to your spirit and let it guide us whenever we open the book and read. Amen. So, as we have gathered here to worship on this World Communion Sunday, 
we recognize that all Christians around the world are connected by their faith. Whether they are Eastern Orthodox or Coptic, whether they are Methodist or Presbyterian, whether they are Catholic or something you may never even have heard of. If they say they are Christians and follow Christ, we are connected. And that's true even as we sometimes struggle to understand how so many different views of Christ can be compatible. Honestly, there are times when we might find it hard to believe that some variations of faith actually reflect the same God and Christ that we understand at all, because they seem so different. With that in mind, we are called to understand that not only all Christians, but all people on earth are children of God, regardless of their faith, of how they understand God, of how they worship. If you believe in one God, you believe we are all children of that God. So all of that was on my mind as I pray for guidance on what message to share this week. And I must confess, it's not often that I will choose a psalm as the passage to focus on. Psalms are usually, O oh God, forgive us for what we've done. O oh God, we follow you without doubt. O oh God, we lament that something horrible has happened. And there's other variations on it, but those are kind of the main themes. And I tend to look more to the gospel for messages. And even this week, as I read through the scriptures for the first time, those that are assigned by the lectionary, this particular Psalm 26 did not catch my attention as something to look more deeply at. In the New Revised Standard Version, the Psalm is titled, a plea for justice and a declaration of righteousness. And now it's important to remember that those subtitles are not part of the original scripture. They are actually created by the translators of the Bible to help folks kind of understand, give them an idea of what it's talking about. But they do that. They had me thinking, okay, this is just another passage about righteousness. So at first reading, that's what I took away from this. It's another psalm where we're seeking God's favor, and the author is claiming that they were seeking to live a good and righteous life, just like so many of the psalms do. So I set it aside. And that's part of my typical process for developing a message. I take a quick first look at the assigned readings and see if any of them jump out at me with something that says, this needs to be looked at more deeply. And then I go back to do that, and I read whatever has jumped out at me a second, a third, a fourth time, listening for where the Spirit may guide me. For those of you who are familiar with the term, it's sort of a Lectio Divino process. But this week, my first and even my second read through all of the readings, didn't give me any good direction. So I think it was probably on my third time going through the readings again that I was interrupted by something as I began to read Psalm 26. I forget if it was a phone call or someone coming into the office, but something made me put the writing down and divert my attention. And when I came back to it, I tried to pick up right where I had left off at verses 4 and 5. And that is where I suddenly saw the passage in a very different light. By not having passages one through three as an introduction, the first thing I saw was, I do not sit with the worthless, nor do I consort with hypocrites. I hate the company of evildoers, and I will not sit with the wicked. Hmm. In their fuller context, 
it's easy to see that these are statements of a person telling God, I stay out of trouble. I avoid temptation and I seek to live a good life. But seeing them on their own, they struck me differently. These things which the author was seeking to avoid are the very things that made up such an important aspect of Jesus' ministry and life. He literally sat with those that others considered worthless, but he didn't see them that way. He consorted and he had important discussions with those that he considered hypocrites, the Sadducees and the Pharisees and others. But not just to argue, he was seeking to teach them something new. Jesus actually seemed to enjoy and seek out the company of those that the righteous considered evildoers and the wicked, people such as tax collectors, those possessed by evil spirits. And Jesus offered them a grace that others would not, letting them know they were worthy of God's love regardless of who they were or what they had done in their life. We know that Jesus lived a countercultural life, doing many things that challenged the religious leaders of his time, and often bringing them into conflict with himself. So I saw great irony in this passage from Psalm 26 all of a sudden. At the same time as fully understanding the intent of its author, trying to say, God, I'm going to live a good life. I'm going to avoid these temptations and these things that might make me stumble. It's a song to God declaring that one is seeking to turn from evil, wickedness, and temptation. All those things that the people of Israel had been taught to avoid for so long. And yet, as I read it, I realized that at the same time it seems to assign blame for those things, the evil and the wickedness and the hypocrisy to the others who are involved in them. The passage doesn't say, God, I will not be a hypocrite. I will not be evil. It says, I will not sit with hypocrites. I hate the company of evildoers. But the person is not saying, God, I will not do those things. Now, that may be semantics, it may be the poetry, it may be there's more in the Hebrew that I don't understand that, that changes the meaning, but reading that English translation and starting with that passage, path, uh, verse 4, suddenly that's what jumped out to me about this passage. The message that I get from Christ is one that recognizes that the challenges of hypocrisy are all around us. A message that calls us to be aware of them, yes, but to do something to address them also. Not simply put the blame on others and say, well, I won't sit with them and then I'll be okay. Jesus changed the equation by actively seeking to change the world, not just working to avoid the unsavory parts, but by engaging them and saying to them, I have something different for you. I find a lesson for all of us in that, and I pray that I seek to follow Jesus' lead in my life, to actively engage and seek to transform the world, not to simply avoid people who are perhaps the ones in greatest need of transformation. On this World Communion Sunday, may we pray that however the various denominations of Christianity may understand Christ, they all seek to do more than just declare themselves righteous and actively seek to live as Christ did, engaging the world 
and seeking its transformation rather than running away from it. Amen. Let us take a moment to prepare for our prayer time as we hear the prayer song this morning, In God Alone. Let us begin our time of prayer this morning with a simple prayer of thanksgiving. Gracious God, we give you thanks for all that you provide us, for the bounty on our tables, the roofs over our heads. And we give you thanks for the people of this community who give so much to the work of this church as we seek to carry out Christ's message to live out his gospel in this world. We give thanks for those who have been able to give financially, for those who give with their being, their hearts, their hands, their voices, for those who give with their presence in the community, being your messengers to others, simply by how they act. Lord, we give thanks for all these things. Amen. As we do each week, we would also like to share the concerns that come from the community. We want to begin today with prayers of thanks for Sharon, Matt, and the family as they have come through a tough COVID scare with everyone having negative results. We hope to see them amongst us again soon. We continue to pray for Dottie as she adjusts to her new setting at Brookdale. And for Eric as he also adjusts to a new setting after moving to a facility in the Bronx where he can be closer to his son. Glenda has let us know that prayers are appreciated for her friend Michelle who's recently been diagnosed with cancer and has that long road ahead of her. And Martha has recently asked for continued prayers for her sister Jean and Jean's family as they grieve the loss of her husband, Pete. We also want to lift up Joyce as she faces some health issues in the days ahead. And Sandy and Bob as she has gone into rehab at Baptist. And finally, we want to mention, especially, continued prayers for the leaders of our public and private schools as they continue to monitor how COVID is impacting schools now that they are open. And as they face making tough decisions that maintain safety for all of the school personnel and the students and all those interconnected families. Let us take a moment now to also lift up the names that each of us holds in our hearts in a moment of silence.
great God of love, we lift up those we have named this morning, recognizing that you are already fully aware of each of them. Yet we add our voices of concern, of joy, of pleading that they find what they need in the days ahead. Lord, we also ask you on this day of World Communion to instill our faith, to guide us as we seek to be your hands and feet on this world, as we seek to live with each other, to support each other, not just those in our church, but so many others in the community and around the world who are sharing similar prayers today. Sometimes we have a tendency to self-focus, to talk about those that we know and lose track of the interconnectedness of all of your children. On a day like this, we strive to be more aware of that. To be aware that not only are people in churches around the world today, but people across every nation turn to their leaders and say, what can you do to serve us? What can you do to make our lives better? And we pray that those leaders focus on that joint welfare as well. God of love and hope, fill our lives with both of those. Lift us up when we feel down. Let us sense you are with us when we feel lonely. And help us to follow the gospel of Christ that provides hope, sight for the blind, freedom for those who have been jailed. Help us to know that your world is a good one and that the troubles we face each day can be overcome if only we think of each other. And let us share now in those words that your son taught to us, and taught to his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. With these thoughts of world communion and your saving grace in our minds, I invite everyone to join now in the closing hymn, one that should be familiar to many people, Amazing Grace. We'll be singing verses one through four.
And so let us go from this place out into that world today where we have so many brothers and sisters in faith, those that we agree with, those that we wonder about, those who may challenge us as we all seek to follow Christ. May we go seeking to live out that gospel that Jesus gave us, that good news. May we go with our hearts open to the Holy Spirit, inviting it to guide us. And may we go knowing that as your children, each person in this world is deserving of your love and ours. Amen.